Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Quiet, please, for tonight. Written and directed by Willis Cooper and not featuring Artist Chapel, does not bring you two noted guest stars of the stage, the screen, and radio in Ralph Morgan and Claudia Morgan. The story tonight is called Three Sides to a Story. We were walking along this road, and it was dark, sort of like twilight. A long, straight road, and there wasn't anybody else on it. Just us three, Victor and Francis and me. And we were walking along. It was kind of funny we were walking along. As long as I could remember, I mean, as long as I'd known him, Victor has gone around in a wheelchair. But he was walking down the road with us. And then we came to these three stones alongside the road. You know, like milestones, sort of. And they were the only things you could see along there in the twilight. Three stones, and there were three of us. And I said to Victor, I wonder what those stones are. And Victor said, I don't know. And then Frances spoke up. And she said, I bet I know what they are, Clyde. And we said, what? And she said, I bet there are tombstones. And so we kind of laughed and walked on a little further, and all of a sudden there was a big red glow in the sky ahead, and it looked like a fire, and we wondered what it was. After a minute or two, we could see the flames even, and it looked like it was the biggest fire any of us had ever seen. And we kept walking down the road toward it, and we still didn't know what it was. I want to tell you the story, how we three came to be walking down this road at night towards this fire. We lived in California, a beautiful little house up on top of a hill, way up in Topanga Canyon, which is one of the passes along the mountains from the ocean to the San Fernando Valley. Beautiful view, you know, with a little private road turning up to the house, a drop of six or seven hundred feet practically right off the front porch. Victor was retired, been a doctor in Michigan, got some disease that put him permanently into a wheelchair, came out to California in 1938, married Francis two years ago. They hired me as a kind of handyman, companion, what have you. Pushed Victor around in the wheelchair, and the top of a mountain in Topanga Canyon is a swell place for a wheelchair, believe me. Well, so I got to be kind of one of the family. You know how it is. You know, there's more than one side to every story. This is my side. Honestly, I hadn't noticed it till one day last fall, when Francis and I were sitting up on the porch having a cold drink. Victor was in the house taking a nap. I was just sitting there, looking down the hillside. You know what, Clyde? What? You're awfully good looking. Well, thanks, Francis. No, I mean it. You're good looking, too. Mm-hmm. I got to drive over to Canoga Park for some groceries. I'll stay here a while. There's no rush. Maybe I'll go with you. Well, I have to go pretty soon. You've got the nicest hair. I had to give you a quarter. No, really. I had to get a job in pictures. You'd be terrific. They put caps on your teeth. You got good teeth. You want another drink? I don't think so. Yes, sir. You're quite a hunk of a man, boy. You ain't so bad yourself. Oh, me? You know, if I'd met you before I met Victor, I could have gone for you. Well, I'm going for the groceries. Oh, sit still. There's lots of time. And we're having fun. You are. What do you mean? Ribbing me. I'm not ribbing you, Clyde. What do you call it, then? <laughs> I'm making love to you. Cut it out, Francis. Yes, sir. If it wasn't for Victor... Maybe we ought to knock him off. Maybe we ought to. 
Well, I'm going to get the car. Wait a minute. Huh? Give me a kiss. Oh, come on now. I said give me a kiss. Come here. Now. Listen, Francis. Victor. Now. Oh, why, Clyde, how nice. As Clyde said, there is more than one side to a story. I want to tell my side, Victor, Francis' husband, the man in the wheelchair. I wasn't asleep. I had been, but Frances' voice is sometimes louder than she thinks it is, and it awakened me. There's one thing about a wheelchair. It moves quite silently. I had rolled over to the doorway just in time to see Frances and Clyde embracing, and I quickly slid it out of sight. I don't know why. I suppose it was more or less instinctive, and I waited till he went down the porch steps before I pushed the door open. Oh, are you awake? Obviously, my dear. Clyde's gone for the groceries. I thought I heard his voice. He just left. Have a good sleep? Oh, very nice. Like a drink? I think I'll wait. There goes Clyde now. Hi, right, boy. What's the matter with him? Why? Well, he looked sort of embarrassed or something. Oh, you're crazy, Victor. He's a big, handsome brute, isn't he? Who, Clyde? Oh, sure. I wonder how tall he is. I'm sure I don't know. You know, I was five foot ten before I took to this chair. I know. These big huskies, you know, they never realise how lucky they are. Why? I mean, compared to me, I know I never gave it a thought when I was in good health. Oh, don't talk that way, Victor. You've got a lot of things Clyde hasn't got. I've got you, dear. I mean like money. Money really isn't so important. You know, Victor, I wonder why it is. Why what is, dear? Why people who have lots of money are always the ones who make that crack about money not being important. Well, I suppose you have to have money first to discover how unimportant it is. I suppose that's it. I'd sure like to have the chance to find out whether it is or not. Are you hinting that I ought to increase your allowance? No, no, I don't mean that. I mean, I'd like to have just, just buckets of money. We're fairly well fixed, you know. I know, but that's your money, Victor. I'd like to have bags and bags of my own. Well, all you have to do, my dear, is wait till I die. Oh, but I want it. Uh, I'm sorry, Victor. What would you do with it? Why, I'd buy all the clothes in the world and I'd travel. I'd go to San Francisco and Santa Barbara and New York and... And leave me here roosting on a mountainside. I'm glad you haven't got it. Oh, Victor, I didn't mean... I I'm sorry. Oh, forget it, darling. I couldn't resist the temptation to kid you a little. Well, I, I am sorry. I'll tell you what. It is rough on you being cooped up here. Why don't you have Clyde drive you up to Santa Barbara tomorrow or the next day? Oh, Victor, really? I guess we can afford it. Oh, gee, and I can get some new clothes. And I think I can trust Clyde with you. What? I mean, trust him not to let you buy too much. Oh, shall I get you a drink now? <laughs> So now you want to hear my side of the story. Well, I'm not quite ready to tell it yet. And I may surprise you when I do tell you. Let Clyde tell you some more. Here, Clyde. Well, I drove her to Santa Barbara. Victor said he'd be all right in the house alone for one day. He said he'd be back by evening, though. So we started just before sunset, coming down the coast road. I was kind of wondering about Francis, you know. 
But she didn't say a thing out of the ordinary, so I figured, well, let it pass. We were just passing Point Mugu, you know, where the Japanese fishing village used to be before the war, and now the Navy shoots rockets or something like that. And Francis said, pull up. So I pulled off the road. Well, I said. You can kiss me now, Clyde. Oh, I can, huh? Yes. Listen, Francis. Please, Clyde. Well... Clyde, I think Victor saw us. What? When? Yesterday afternoon, when you kissed me. He was asleep. I don't think he was. Listen, Francis. So one more kiss won't hurt. I... Just one more, though. I... Don't you love me? Francis, listen to me. You're Victor's wife, and I like Victor. Why, I like him too, Clyde. I guess maybe you better not kiss me after all. Well, You're right. Let's drive on. It's getting dark and I worry about Victor. So do I. Gee, it was fun today. With a lot of money to spend, I really wish I had a lot of money. Gosh, Victor's got a lot, hasn't he? Oh, sure. And if he dies, I'll get... Oh, I mustn't talk that way. No, don't. I worry about him sometimes, Clyde. You know, in that wheelchair, if he'd ever roll off the porch up there, why, he'd fall all the way down the mountainside. Why, he'd be smashed to pieces, wouldn't he? Wouldn't he? Francis kissed Clyde again today. I said a wheelchair is remarkably silent. They didn't hear me as I wheeled myself from the living room to the kitchen, and they didn't see me. I didn't speak until they had moved away from each other, but if I have ever seen guilt written on two persons' faces, I saw it then. It's been two months since I saw that first kiss on the porch. Was this the second, or...? I'm a suspicious fool. Of course my wife loves me. Of course Clyde is a loyal friend. What am I thinking of? I mean, I'd like to have just, just buckets of money. I am a suspicious fool. Oh, but I want it. I am a suspicious fool. I must have Clyde oil this wheelchair. I think I detected the faintest squeak in the right wheel. It would be nice to be married to Frances, wouldn't it? I think she's the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. It's funny. How long have I been here with them? I never particularly noticed before how beautiful she is. Victor's changed, though, hasn't he? I never used to notice how stingy he is. Poor Frances. She deserves everything in the world. Money and good times and everything. Well, I like Victor, sure. But it'll be a great break for Frances when he dies. She'll be rich, like she wants to be. I wonder where I'll fit into the picture, then. What am I thinking about? Victor's my friend, even if I do work for him. And Francis is his wife. I've got to stop this. I'll be thinking about murdering the guy next thing. Why, hello, Francis. What were you thinking about, then, Clyde? What do you mean, when... When I came out on the porch just now. Why, just thinking. About me? Well... Were you? Kind of. You're a nice boy, and Francis loves you. Where's Victor? Upstairs, reading. You know what I wish? What? I wish you and I could go for a ride. Well, we can't. You know that. Sure, I know it. But the moon's so nice. Wouldn't you like to, though? But we can't. I know it. But there's no harm in saying we'd like to, is there? Of course not. What would we do? Would we drive down to the beach? I guess so. Would you kiss me? Francis! Would you? Stop it, Francis. Don't you love me, Clyde? Francis, please. Don't you? Please. Clyde. You know I love you. Shh. Be careful. 
You said he was upstairs. Well, he's not deaf. I'm sorry. I'm not. Well, now you know. Yes, now I know. Clyde. What? I'm going in. No, wait. It'd be awfully nice being married to you. Francis, don't say that. Wouldn't you like it? Yes, but... But what? Victor. Mm Mm-hmm. Clyde, do you love me enough to do something for me? Pretty near anything. Anything? Anything. What do you want me to do? Nothing now. What do you mean? I'll ask you to do something for me some day. Will you do it then? What is it? I'll ask you some day. Promise you will. I promise. But I wish... Kiss me, darling. Wait. Listen. What is it? I thought I heard a squeak. Like that one wheel on Victor's chair. <laughs> a surgeon, as I think Clyde told you. I was formerly a rather expert diagnostician. I possessed also, I flatter myself, that detachment that is such an important asset in my profession. I have performed operations on close friends with the same objectivity that I employed upon unknowns. Therefore, I was able to apply the same impersonal approach to the diagnosis of a case in which I might be presumed to be the most interested party. It is interesting. My conclusions were easily arrived at. I was in danger of my life. Francis had spoke of marrying Clyde. Clyde was obviously under an influence that I at least recognised as sinister. My wife, The woman that I married for love, the woman that I had cherished, my wife was plotting my death. For the most sordid of all motives, money. I do not deny that I am careful with money. Remembering back through the years of our marriage, Francis had always been impatient about money matters. I remember the talk that we had that first brought the whole thing to my attention. I was certain that I was right. She would, when Clyde had been properly brought to heel, demand that he murder me. And Clyde would do it. I had only two uncertainties. One, when. The other, how. If I could learn these, I could defend myself. And I intended to defend myself to the utmost. To the utmost, my friend. If they plotted murder, I could plot murder. And I might succeed where they could fail. It was an interesting problem. The professional against the amateur. My wife, who I had loved, well. I can't, Francis. You promised, Clyde. I didn't know what you meant. Yes, you did. I didn't. You did, Clyde. I tell you. You knew what I meant the minute I said it. I... Didn't you? I tell you. Didn't you? Well, I... And you promised. I can't do it, Francis. It'll be so easy, Clyde. No. Just a little easy push on the back of the wheelchair. No. And then we'll go away and be married and have so much money. Clyde, don't you want to marry me? You know I do. Well, then... Can't we wait? Darling, I've waited and waited and waited for you. And I won't wait any longer. I want to marry you and you know. Well, you know. Francis, do you really mean you'll marry me? What do you think? Oh, Francis. Francis. No, no, not now. No more kisses, darling, until... We can't do this. We can and we will. But... Look, darling, sit down, and I'll tell you exactly what to do. Now listen, it'll be so easy. Clyde has been looking at me very strangely today. I think perhaps the time is getting short. (coughs) 
But how can we be sure he won't fall out of the chair, Francis, and just get hurt a little? You'll have to think up some way to keep him in it, darling. But I can't. I, I don't know how. You'll get an idea, darling, but do it soon. Today, Clyde installed a strap on my wheelchair to hold down the blanket I usually wear across my knees, he says. Now I know how it is to be done. It's a long drop down the canyon from the porch. But when will we be married, darling? I mean, how soon? Just as quickly as we possibly can. We'll have to wait a little while, at least, until his will is probated. And I get the money. And then... But we mustn't do it too quickly. And make people suspicious, you know? We could go to Mexico, couldn't we? We'll go wherever we want to. I wish there was some other way. There isn't. Now go away. He mustn't see us talking together so much. You think he's got any idea? Of course not. He hasn't the faintest idea in the world. I have armed myself. Found an old favorite hunting knife that I haven't used for years. It will fit nicely under my blanket, and I hope that I have not forgotten how to use it. I think I shall not have long to wait. And I have discovered another curious thing. There is a revolver in Francis's purse, a short-barreled, ugly little weapon, and it is loaded. I wonder. This is the night. This is the night I keep my promise to Francis. It's a hot night. We don't usually have hot nights up here in the canyon. As we sit on the porch, we talk about it. Awfully warm, isn't it? I've never seen it as hot. Earthquake weather. What? Earthquake weather. They say when it's hot and sultry like this, it breeds earthquakes. Oh, that silly Clyde. Clyde. No, it isn't, Victor. I remember. Clyde. What? Now. And for a second, I don't know what she means, but she says it again. Now! And her voice cracks like a black snake whip, and I jump to my feet, and she's staring at me, and I stretch out my hand to the back of Victor's wheelchair. And now, listen to my side of it. I told you I'd surprise you, unless you've guessed it already. That's just the way it was. Awfully hot, isn't it? I've never seen it so hot. Earthquake weather. What? Earthquake weather. They say when it's hot and sultry like this, it breeds earthquakes. Oh, that's silly, Clyde. And I said Clyde. No, it isn't, Victor. I remember... And I said now! And he started to move slowly towards Victor's chair. And just as he reached out for the back of it, I yanked the little revolver out of my purse and aimed it straight between his eyes. Yes, Clyde's eyes. Shall I tell you my third side of the story now? I was sitting there, and I said, Awfully hot, isn't it? I've never known it so hot. Earthquake weather. What? Earthquake weather. They say when it's hot and sultry like this, it breeds earthquakes. Oh, that silly Clyde. Clyde? No, it isn't, Victor. I remember... And I heard Francis speak again. Clyde! And he stumbled to his feet, and I knew this was it. Over my shoulder, I saw him coming towards me, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw the ugly little nose of that pistol in Francis's hand, pointing straight at Clyde, and I flung myself out of the chair, and I knew I had won. I drew back the hunting knife to hurl it straight at Francis's heart, and... Yes, it was earthquake weather. No, nobody actually murdered anybody. But there are three bodies up there in Topanga Canyon, buried so far under wreckage in a thousand tons of hillside that nobody will ever find them. And the three of us, Victor, Francis, and I, were walking down this long straight road together toward that fire I told you about. I guess you don't actually have to commit murder to be guilty of it. If you think about it, and you plot and plan it, 
Well, that's enough. You get punished anyway. You know what that big fire we're walking into is? We know. You have listened to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. Clyde, the man who spoke to you, was Paul Nero. Brian Hunt played the part of Victor. Virginia Hargrove played Francis. Music for Quiet, Please is composed and played by Gene Carrasso. Now for a word about next week's Quiet, Please, here is our writer-director, Willis Cooper. We have an unusual mystery story for you on our next appearance, a story in which you yourself play a most important part. It's called How Are You, Pal? Hope you listen, Pal. And so, until next week at this same time, I am quietly yours, Ernest Chappell. Quiet Please came to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>